SCP-3288, The Aristocrats. Stop me if you've heard this one. A man walks into a talent agency and says that he's got an act he wants to pitch to him, a family act. The talent agent asks what the act consists of, to which the man goes into great, sordid detail about what his family does on stage, much to the agent's horror. Afterwards, the agent asks what the act is called, to which the man simply declares, The Aristocrats. Chances are you have heard a version of this joke, a favorite among stand-up comedians designed to test the limits of the comedian's creativity in taboos and tastelessness. SCP-3288 is titled The Aristocrats, partly because it is quite literally related to the aristocracy, but also because much like that classic joke, it's about a family that does some pretty shocking and horrific things. Let's dive in. SCP-3288 is the designation for a highly predatory species known as Homo anthropophagus, with anthropo meaning human and phagus meaning to eat. SCP-3288 display a number of abnormal characteristics and behaviors that distinguish them from the baseline species, such as acute hyperdontia and macrodontia, meaning that they have more teeth than normal and their teeth are also larger than normal. An instance of SCP-3288 has teeth approximately six times the size of normal adult teeth, with more than 60 of them unevenly distributed over six distinct rows requiring jaws much larger than that of baseline humans. Additionally, they possess gross mandibular prognathism, so their lower jaws have outgrown the upper, and their arms are unusually long, generally more than twice the length of a baseline human. Their fingers and toes are also longer than normal, and they possess more of them, and their spines are curved into a hunchback. Despite their appearance of severe emaciation, however, they possess abnormal muscle strength and have superior low-light vision. More unusual traits include complete albinism, so they lack skin pigment, a complete lack of hair across their bodies, and their eyes are different colors, ranging from blue to red to purple or yellow. They grow rapidly, with a 2-3 to three week gestation period, and sexual maturity reached within 16-20 to 20 months. They can move on two legs or down on all fours, but they have a syndrome on their hands and fingers in which a layer of enamel forms over the skin, which tends to fracture and shift, causing pain. Finally, they possess acute photophobia, a fear and weakness to direct sunlight. They have a mental instability, primarily characterized by delusions of grandeur and malignant narcissism, and an addiction to human flesh that takes on biological and psychological components. To summarize then, they are large, gangly, albino humanoids with too many teeth, mentally unstable, and an addiction to eating humans. These abnormalities are primarily the result of excessive inbreeding, but without the increased chance for certain recessive or harmful traits, especially those related to infertility, higher infant and child mortality, and loss of immune function. These detrimental traits have not only been negated but inversely amplified, resulting in longer lifespans, increased resistance to disease, and anomalously high levels of fertility. So in addition to everything else, it seems that they've mastered inbreeding. The Foundation became aware of SCP-3288 while investigating reports of unexplained disappearances in Vienna. It was discovered that the disappearances occurred in close proximity to sewer holes and access tunnels, and primarily targeted the most vulnerable of the local population such as prostitutes, unsupervised children, transients, and inebriated or otherwise indisposed individuals. Two agents were dispatched to Vienna in order to determine whether or not a number of the unexplained disappearances were of an anomalous nature. Interviews with local law enforcement and government officials revealed that human remains belonging to three individuals had been recovered, 
but this information was not released to the public due to concerns of causing further panic. The remains were promptly confiscated and delivered to a nearby humanoid containment site. There, some autopsies were performed on the remains, each one being gruesome. One was the upper torso of a body with a loosely attached head, the face being unrecognizable. The arms, much like the rest of the body, were not found at the scene of the attack, and the cause of death was deemed to be exsanguination, or the body being drained of blood. The second body had been disemboweled and suffered destructive trauma to the thoracic cage, which was then pried open. All of their internal organs were missing, along with a sizable amount of flesh, and the cause of death was deemed to be traumatic cardiac arrest. Finally, the third set of remains was little more than a pile of shattered bones and bodily fluids, with the cause of death unknown. None of the bodies displayed injuries corresponding with a human attacker, and the doctor performing the autopsies compared the deceased to victims of hyena attacks. He concluded that all sustained injuries were caused by a mix of teeth, claws, and raw physical strength. Bite marks were found to coincide with human teeth, despite their abnormal size and number, requiring jaws much larger than that of baseline humans. Further analysis revealed unique patterns among the bite marks, suggesting that there existed more than one source. The entities responsible for these deaths were classified as anomalous, and received the SCP-3288 designation. MTF Sigma-6, Hellsingers, were ordered to patrol the Leopoldstadt district while incognito, the district having seen the highest number of recorded disappearances. Operatives were instructed to target SCP-3288 with tracking darts, and to refrain from lethal force. The first field log is dated as October 6th, 1988, as 12 MTF operatives patrolled the Leopoldstadt district, while 10 others maintained watch over known sewer holes and access tunnels. Shortly after midnight, two operatives reported hearing a muffled scream near a canal, and sought to investigate the matter while requesting backup. Support arrived three minutes later, but found only the mangled remains of the two agents, as well as the half-consumed body of a local civilian. The decapitated body of one of the agents was pulled from the canal, with his neck having sustained injuries suggesting that his head had been severed or destroyed by a single bite. A trail of blood and entrails led to the other agent, who had been torn in half along the waist. He had successfully crawled into an alleyway before succumbing to his injuries. The mission was deemed a success despite this, as one of the agents had successfully struck the SCP-3288 instance with a tracking dart before dying, achieving the mission's primary objective. The entity was tracked into the sewers until the signal began to fade before entirely disappearing somewhere below the Hofburg, the former Imperial Palace of Vienna and the official residence and workplace of the President of Austria. Due to the progressively declining nature of the signal, it's believed that the device had been brought far deeper than even the sewers should have accommodated. The second field log is from later that morning, as the MTF operatives were divided into four teams of five, three of which were sent in to investigate the sewers, and one to remain on standby. Constructed in the mid-19th century, the sewers of Vienna are part of a larger network of subterranean tunnels that includes catacombs, abandoned wine cellars, and underground rivers. By triangulating the last known location of the tracked entity, the Foundation hoped to minimize the possibility of escape and public exposure. While it's preferable that the operatives secured and contained the threat, lethal force was authorized at their discretion. At 9 a.m., the agents reached the destination where the signal was lost, but initially failed to discover anything of significance. After several hours of investigation, however, one agent encountered human skeletal remains while wading through waist-deep water. Closer analysis of this area uncovered a number of loose bricks, whose removal revealed an unrecorded subterranean chamber 
whose walls were engraved with the House of Habsburg's coat of arms. The chamber included 24 sarcophagi, and was presumably a family crypt belonging to the House of Habsburg, despite there existing no records of its creation. The statues primarily depict women wearing veils over their eyes with a single finger held to their lips. The tombs, though intricate and reflective of their status, lacked any indication as to who may have been interred within. Prying open the sarcophagi, however, revealed the skeletal remains of over 300 infants, all displaying severe and likely fatal deformities. The original entrance to the crypt had been evidently destroyed, the stairs shattered and buried in soil. At the far end of the chamber was a vault door, composed of bronze, with no apparent means of access, and seemingly impenetrable without proper equipment. The vault door displayed the House of Habsburg's coat of arms, along with the engraved words, Ad Puritatum Sanguinis, meaning, for purity of blood. Operatives were ordered to hold their current location and await the arrival of an infiltration team, while other Foundation agents organized the temporary evacuation of the Hofburg and the sealing of all sewer access points throughout the city. MTF agents maintained shifts throughout the night, making repeated attempts to open the vault door. At noon the following day, the surface had been fully evacuated, and an infiltration team had arrived at the crypt. Using oxy fuel torches over the course of two hours, the bronze gate was carved apart, bypassing intricate mechanisms which were likely related to opening it normally. Inside of it, they found a spiral staircase, and an eight-person squad equipped with heavy tactical armor and M16 rifles were sent in. Their radio transmissions grew increasingly faint as they traveled an estimated 65 meters underground. Reaching the bottom of the stairwell, they found that the gray stone of the crypt had been replaced with masterfully crafted marble floors, carpets, and white painted walls and ceilings. The large chamber here was found to be architecturally identical to the Swiss wing of Hofburg Palace, closely resembling the styles popular during the 18th century. The location also contained various sculptures and Corinthian columns, while paintings and tattered tapestries adorned its walls. All depictions of the human form had been literally defaced, regardless of artistic medium. The operatives described the air as having an odor not dissimilar to rotten meat and stale sweat, with the floor and walls discolored with what appeared to be exceptionally old blood. Traveling through a southeast corridor, operatives entered what appeared to be the area's equivalent of the Hofburg's Imperial Library, with the difference being the presence of a working 18th century laboratory. One of the operatives, fluent in both German and Latin, discovered documents involving alchemy, biology, and the occult. A decorative writing desk and accompanying throne were located at the far end of the chamber with the desk containing documents relating to transactions, contracts, and private journals. Continuing on, they reached the ballroom and opera hall, describing the air as especially fetid, although there was also the presence of perfume. The area contained a number of musical instruments, all of which displayed evidence of recent use. There were several elongated tables located throughout the chamber, meaning that this ballroom was evidently used as a dining hall as well. Atop the tables were human remains in various levels of decomposition and culinary presentation. A bell abruptly began to toll and was followed by the automatic music of a nearby pipe organ, which played for approximately three minutes. When the pipe organ ceased playing discordant music, it was followed by the sound of opening doors and an increasing number of shuffling footsteps. Seven of the operatives managed to hide behind the curtains of the opera hall, but one tripped over a pile of bones and was forced to take cover behind a harpsichord. 
The ballroom's wide gates opened as video revealed the dim light of lanterns swaying in the hands of a number of 3288 entities, dressed in the garb of 18th century courtiers. They are followed by others, wearing increasingly extravagant, although ragged, attire. All of the outfits appeared to contain different shades of red, deeply contrasting with their chalk-white skin, porcelain masquerade masks, and powdered wigs. A pair of smaller entities entered behind the others, one blowing a rusty trumpet, while the other acted as a standard bearer, holding a crudely painted ensign depicting a red lion on a black field. The trumpeter appeared to make an announcement, but the words are unintelligible due to the guttural nature of their speech. The trumpeter and standard bearer then quickly moved aside, although their stunted legs caused them to tumble and roll as they fled. There now appeared to be several hundred 3288 entities throughout the ballroom, and one of the operatives activated a silent distress call, requesting heavy support. All of the entities then proceeded to kneel and lower their heads, as an exceptionally corpulent 3288 entity entered the room, carried by other entities via an enlarged and reinforced chair. The morbidly obese individual, classified as 3288-Alpha, was dressed in a patchwork of noble finery, stitched together from various fabrics to create a single outfit capable of fitting its frame. It also wore a crown that was too small for its head, held in place by an overgrowth of flesh, and in place of a masquerade mask, it hid its face beneath a red shroud. A large iron cauldron was delivered to the Alpha's table, the container appearing to vibrate of its own accord. A small 3288 entity climbed atop the Alpha's shoulder, proceeding to lift its red veil while leaving its eyes covered, while another small entity removed the cauldron's cover. The Alpha sniffed the air before lifting the cauldron and pouring its contents down its anomalously large mouth and gullet. Part of its meal wiggled free revealing that the cauldron contained living infants displaying severe deformities. The other entities then raised their masks and began to feast with voracious enthusiasm. During the feast, an exceptionally tall specimen approached the harpsichord and grabbed the agent hiding behind it. It then lifted him by his head, unhinged his jaw, and quickly forced him down its throat, feet first, while the other entities continued feasting. The gathering eventually became orgiastic, making no distinction between the apparent age or sex of the participants, willing or otherwise. An explosion, however, rocked the event, causing mass casualties among the 3288, it's hypothesized that the devoured agent survived his ordeal and was able to eventually activate an explosive device, sacrificing himself in order to terminate or otherwise incapacitate a great number of hostile entities. Panic spread among the remaining 3288, and the other operatives used the opportunity to chemically sedate the survivors. With the arrival of reinforcements, the surviving 3288 entities were secured and contained at the nearest humanoid containment site. The sheer size of the Alpha entity, however, necessitated the use of a specialized crane, and the creation of a shaft directly connecting the underground chamber to the surface. Following the removal of the Alpha, as well as all relevant documents and objects, the underground area was filled with cement and reburied. An interview was performed between a Foundation researcher and the Alpha Entity. The Entity weighs more than 1600 kilograms, and its legs have atrophied, but is still considered dangerous. It's also blind and incapable of reading or writing, with the interior of its hollow sockets having pushed outward to the point of prolapse. It's fluent in Austrian German specifically preferring to speak a dialect that was spoken by the Imperial Habsburg family and the nobility of Austria-Hungary. 
The researcher begins by asking the entity its name, stating that its cooperation is not optional. The entity is angered, however, that the meat wishes to speak, and should only speak when spoken to. It then asks why the meat is taunting it with an intoxicating aroma as saliva spills from its muzzle. The doctor states again that cooperation is not optional, and activates electrodes placed on the entity, causing it to shudder and growl. This only serves to further confuse the entity, asking how can meat hurt it, and how can meat disobey. The researcher activates the electrodes again, although the alpha entity doesn't seem affected by them this time. Instead, it tells the researcher that they do not submit, they dominate. It tells him that they will devour him and his peasant kin, and their witchcraft will not harm him because their blood is pure and resilient. The researcher, however, merely turns to the security officer and asks him to illuminate the subject because his vision doesn't work so well in these dim cells. The security officer turns his flashlight onto the entity, immediately causing him to scream and convulse, crying that it yields and that their soul skitters from the flame. The officer turns off his flashlight, and the researcher says that he noticed light sensitivity during the entity's transfer, even without having eyes. He asks again its name, and the entity says that it is the Imperial Majesty, Emperor Maximilian the Great, King of Austria, and Patriarch of the House of Habsburg. It then attempts a courtly bow, and apologizes for its uncouth ways as the doctor is clearly a superior creature, and has asserted himself. He asks if the doctor would like to feast upon its flesh, or engage in coital activities with its festering wound. The doctor is taken aback at the suggestion, but simply says that their customs differ quite significantly. He asks if it was blind from birth, or if it lost its vision accidentally. The entity doesn't answer, however, instead stating that the pleasantries have not yet completed, and he now has it at a disadvantage. It asks the doctor his name, saying that his German accent is distant and strange. The doctor states that he is King Tobias Moser of the Foundation, leaving a note in the document that he believed it to be more productive to play along with the entity's delusions. The entity is glad to hear of this, saying that it all makes sense now. It had sensed nobility, but thought the doctor might be a duke. Now it realizes that he has proven himself far stronger than a simple duke. It seems that the entities associate royal and noble hierarchy with physical power, which is ironic as the alpha entity's immobility prevents it from hunting its own prey. The entity says it has heard of this foundation, saying it to be a marvelous land and people, well known for its many cheeses and wines. It then returns to the question about its eyes, saying that its eyes were too big for their stomach during a feast. The meal was too big, and it was warned by servants, who offered to cut the meat for it but it refused, stating that it is a king and emperor, and it will swallow it whole. The meal ended up being too large, however, causing its eyes to burst from their sockets. The entity says that they did little good anyways, and it promptly consumed them as well. The doctor then asks about the entity's court and the house of Habsburg. The entity says that they are of the same noble blood, but some are more noble than others. Their bloodline is pure and untainted by outsiders. When asked why they eat humans, however, the entity says that they do not eat humans, but rather they eat peasants and undesirables. They devour life, undeserving of life, as that is the nature of nobility. The doctor then says that he has to take his leave, 
and the entity says that it will think of him in his absence, over and over, as it is eager to sample his flavor. A note for the interview states that they may be able to glean more information by playing to its delusions, but it's difficult to say how much of it is true. DNA analysis, however, has revealed that the Alpha Entity, along with all the others, do in fact descend from the House of Habsburg. A number of documents were recovered from the Underground Palace, notably a journal written by Leopold I. Leopold ruled the Holy Roman Empire from 1658 till his death in 1705, and was also the King of Hungary, Croatia, and Bohemia. He was generally regarded as an intellectual, known for his interest in astronomy, alchemy, and the early sciences, but was also said to be the product of a great deal of inbreeding within the House of Habsburg, and his first wife was both his niece and his first cousin. In the journal, Leopold also references Charles II of Spain, who was physically and mentally disabled and infertile, possibly due to massive inbreeding. He would be the last member of the male Spanish Habsburg line, and the physician who performed his autopsy stated that his body did not contain a single drop of blood, his heart was the size of a peppercorn, his lungs corroded his intestines rotten and gangrenous, with a single testicle black as coal, and his head full of water. With that, let's read these excerpts from Leopold's journal. 10th of November, 1700 And with the death of Charles, so dies our noble line in Iberia. I will restore our rightful place. My claim is valid and will not be denied. I already hear the intoxicating drums of war. But his disease, his curse, concerns me greatly. Despite the purity of our blood, untainted for generations, Charles was a sickly creature with the mind of a child. I too was a sickly youth. But my mind remains sharp. I must make use of this blessing before my dynasty succumbs to madness and cretinism. 4th of August, 1701. The Jesuits have exhausted their usefulness. Against my better judgment, I have chosen to seek out those with knowledge of the so-called abominable sciences. Scholars of the forbidden mysteries, both great and terrible. And I have found someone who knows the dark. A woman of rare, almost beguiling beauty. She is older than she appears, for she speaks with the experience of a hundred lifetimes on subjects I had only just begun to grasp. She is a creature of the wild a living embodiment of all that is pagan. I am a stranger in her world, and I am afraid. 22nd of October, 1701. She says that she will teach me, but for a price she will name upon the completion of her tutelage. A strange request, but all she presently asks is that I uphold my end of the bargain. I have more power and wealth than any man alive. Payment will not be difficult. I will not allow our venerable house to fall. But my laboratory is ill-suited for such a task. I have hired workers to begin construction on a new site, something away from the prying eyes of sycophantic courtiers. 19th of December, 1701. My tutelage, though difficult, progresses well. A universal essence, the way of all flesh. It all begins to make sense. My eyes are now open, and I see with such clarity. I will cleanse my family of this curse. 
The essence is malleable, subject to change. But one piece moves the other, you see, resulting in an often unpredictable transmutation. My current experiments make use of the simplest of God's creations, rodents and insects primarily. I have formed living things, creatures whose very visage would sunder even the most resolute of minds. 8th of February, 1702. Construction of the new laboratory goes well. I predict its completion within the next three months. Equipment has been delivered from Damascus. If there is one thing those Mohammedans know, it is the occult sciences. More often than not, my teacher leaves me to my own devices. She appears only at night, though I cannot say from where. She comes and goes as she pleases, my servants seemingly unaware of her presence. 27th of March, 1702. The new laboratory was finished ahead of schedule. The workers merely need to install my equipment, and I can take my experiments to the next tier. But fresh materials are required, and pests will no longer suffice. I am not yet willing to experiment on my own blood, but perhaps there is another way. The workers promise secrecy, but in my dreams I see betrayal. I have come too far to allow such an interference. If the church learns of this, it could ruin everything. These dreams are an omen, and I know they will consume me unless I take swift action. I know what must be done. 15th of April, 1702. My teacher is less understanding than I had expected, for even her heathen heart does not dissuade the disgust and contempt with which she now looks upon me. I did what I had to. For my family, for the purity of our blood, for the immortality of our chosen line. How could this witch understand my burden? She vows to return tomorrow for her payment. I would just have this over with. I am still a man of my word. 16th of April, 1702. I watched her burn. Her sorcery slew many of my guardsmen, but in the end she was detained and delivered to the church. The zealots, having heard my testimony, proved just as eager to see that wretched bitch be consigned to the flames. I know such methods have fallen out of fashion. Thus we committed the act under the cover of darkness and secrecy. I would have granted her land or made her rich as Crassus. But no, that wicked creature sought to be clever. She said I could never save my family without her aid, and demanded, demanded, that I end my rule, destroy all titles and deeds, delivering my land and wealth to the common folk. Did she really believe I would plunge my kingdoms, my empire, into anarchy? Truly, she was mad. But now, nothing remains but ash and cinder, and I may return to my great work, no longer bound by her ethical inflexibility. There is so very much to be done. After this, Leopold's entries became increasingly frenzied and illegible, suggesting a deteriorating mental state until his death in 1705. It appears that he eventually had success, resulting in the creation of SCP-3288, albeit with unintended consequences, via the introduction of an anomalous gene into the family bloodline. 
This gene allows human DNA to resist certain negative conditions associated with inbreeding. The House of Habsburg continued its practice of inbreeding, accelerating the development of mutations. Those with significant deformities were hidden from the public, with the Habsburg monarchs eventually creating vast vaults to house them. The vault-dwelling Habsburgs continued to breed, eventually developing mutations which vastly increased their rate of reproduction, which in turn increased the chances of entirely new mutations. Those of them that more closely resembled baseline humans remained on the surface, while those kept below continued to adapt to subterranean life. DNA analysis revealed that inbreeding grew more extreme over the years, further indicating that it had simply become the norm by the 19th century. It appears that the Habsburg monarchs went to great lengths to provide their vault-dwelling kin with a lifestyle just as extravagant as those above. Documents reveal the steady delivery of food, wine, and entertainment, with these requests becoming more eccentric, strange, and depraved over time. Requests include exotic animals, a barrel of fermented whore piss, fattened children, and instruments of torture. All evidence suggests that these requests were met. Another document appears to imply that the Great Plague of 1738 led to the delivery of a significant amount of feed. It's unknown how long SCP-3288 have survived without outside assistance. One document of singular importance contains a list of vaults, similar to the one found in Vienna. The Foundation has used this information to locate and neutralize a number of 3288 hives but the document itself has been the cause of concern, with half of it being illegible due to mold-related damage. This means that at least half of these vaults cannot be located and will continue to be a significant threat to the public. A later addendum to the document states that there have been a growing number of reports describing violent sexual assaults and acts of cannibalism throughout Central Europe. Closer analysis of these attacks has led the Foundation to conclude that 3288 entities are responsible, and due to the widespread nature of these incidents, it's feared that multiple undiscovered vaults have been breached. An instance of 3288 was recently captured in the Black Forest in Germany, tracked to a derelict hunting lodge. The entity was successfully secured and contained with operatives suffering only minor casualties. Nine bound women were discovered in the basement, only one still alive, and the others displaying ruptured lower abdomens and evidence of partial cannibalization. Autopsies would reveal that the dead had been primarily consumed from within. The survivor was dirty, malnourished, and her lower abdomen was heavily swollen and visibly throbbing. The woman screamed to the operatives, pleading that they get these things out of her, along with various expletives and religious invocations. She received medical evacuation via helicopter, but it crashed approximately five minutes into its flight. Four fetuses were discovered among the wreckage, and although heavily charred, they all displayed mutations associated with SCP-3288. The captured entity was restrained and muzzled in a cell equipped for enhanced interrogation, and was interviewed by a female researcher. The researcher asks it if there are other victims, and if there are, where they are located. This only causes the entity to begin to laugh, so the researcher orders the security officer to shine their light on the entity. The entity shrieks in pain and screams that the researcher is a wretched whore, and how it will pluck out her eyes. The researcher then orders for the torture device to be used, causing the entity's bones to break as it continues to shriek. It eventually yields, and says that if she wants to know about the vessels, she should speak with the Empress, as it is merely a duke. 
the Empress is presumed to be another 3288 entity with similar authority to the Alpha entity. It goes on, saying that they have merely been claiming what is theirs by the divine right of kings. The Empress said that it was time, and for a thousand years their blood has been pure and untouched by the taint of outsiders. The researcher asks why change now, to which the entity responds that their blood is so strong now it overwhelms the blood of the wretched and mudbound. Their line will never die, never fade, and it will become everything. It is their gift, their blessing. The meek will beget the strong, the doomed will beget the chosen, the greedy will devour the charitable, the merciless will ravage the peaceful. They will make the world as perfect as they are, and they will be aristocrats in the end. Their dynasty will never die. So, Leopold I ended up meeting a witch and basically used her incredible magical powers to try to make inbreeding awesome. On the one hand, his bloodline has been quite fruitful, with a countless number of 3288 entities roaming around the world in different places. They are also much stronger and more powerful than baseline humans in a multitude of ways. On the other hand though, they're all quite insane, and their crippling photosensitivity makes them only suited to living below ground. The Foundation has somewhat of an issue here as not only do they have no idea how many of these underground vaults there are out there, but now it seems the entities are planning to sweep out across the world and spread their seed, so to speak. If one of these entities can plant four more into a person who claw their way out, this could pretty easily lead to a dominance shift scenario. It's certainly a repugnant, vile, horrible SCP, but hey, that's the aristocrats. <laughs>